Part number three of daily number 434, where we learn to become a better gamer. It's not my tagline, it's where we learn to be a better gamer. <laughs> Mess up my own log line, it's so good. Where we eventually wind up as people who can play games better than we did before, said Sean clunkily. We've been talking a lot about groups, uh, about grouping things together. Um, and what I want to note is that we can start to compare these groups over time. To say, if you do a super aggressive opening, whether that be fast Zella pushing, fast four gates, fast three gates, big aggressive stalker play, anything that's a super aggressive opening, that you cannot also do any sort of fast tech or fast expand opening. They're necessarily disjointed. You can't do both of them. You can't both get a suit, and this is kind of an illusion that happens when you're under a lot of pressure, where you hold off a four gate and you're like, what if he has Dark Templar soon? He can't have Dark Templar soon. So what we're going to see is Grubby is going to do this in another cute way. Um, if an opponent has an, uh, a sufficient amount of defense, if he built enough units, then he also can't be getting a really fast uh, any tech at all. We're going to see that in this game as uh, specifically. Hmm. So, all right. All right. Grubby popping in. Question, how do we hold off, as Grubby, how do we hold off all those aggressive openings? The super crazy aggro openings from Grubby. Well, he's going to go ahead and check the outskirts of his main, like any good Protoss building two pylons next to his initial gateway to help him deal with uh, aggressive zealot plays because if one pylon falls his gateway doesn't become unpowered and again we see grubby say i'm going to answer aggression by having the units out myself i'm not going to go for a sentry defense that i did in the first game we saw i'm in fact getting my zealot fast i'm getting my stalker fast and i'm building stalker number two quite quickly as well Grubby then builds two uh, gateways to do a very aggressive three-gate play. We see some encircling going on in the middle of the map. Now, we're either up against... Uh, I want to note that this is where some things can often get a little bit disjointed. Let me come back to, let's see here, this notepad and this notepad. There we go. All right, cool. If we go for a fast robo, we can go one zealot, one stalker, one sentry, move out with our first uh, units to kill off a probe he's four gating, and leave one warp gate open for uh, sentry production. This will hold off all of these. Remember how earlier on I was talking about how these groupings depend on your opening? Well, we're about to see that right now. If we go for a fast three gate push all right well what happens if he does a or b if he opens one zealot two stalker three gate pushes or a three stalker push um, we have trouble moving through mid what happens if he goes C? uh let's see here what happens if how do I put that? Do -do 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 -do. Yeah, in this case, if he goes for a lot of early aggression, we have trouble moving through mid. And in fact, A or B might even be an inappropriate way to list this. If he goes A, if he has one zealot, two stalker, this is a one gate opening. This is a two gate for any of you who just didn't know this. If he goes A, we're going to try to out micro. Uh, but more importantly, we're going to build our forward pylon ASAP. A really common thing is that if we're here and he's in the middle of the map and he's met us, he has to spend some stalker shots on our probe, which means that our zealot and our stalker can get extra hits in while he's trying to kill this off. So we're going to try to build our forward pile on ASAP, bring second probe in, but what if he's opening with a three stalker push? If he's doing that, we're probably 
I'm going to lose our probe. We probably can't do a fast uh, three gate push. So I want you to note that in this defensive circumstance, this super er aggro early game, everything was pretty much answerable with the same broad move. In this circumstance, uh, in these, if our opponent's trying to get really aggressive early on, we're going to have to be very micro-oriented if we see him going fast zealot. If we see him, one zeal, two stalker. If we see him going for fast three stalkers, we're probably gonna lose our probe. We probably can't do the fast three gate push. And we're gonna have to do some sort of other follow-up play. Abandon ship. To put everything in terms of ultra clarity, I'm just going to put, um, <laughs> here are our two general broad descriptions of what to do in these two different circumstances. Now, obviously, if he does any combination of one gate play, this is what you should do. Whether he goes one zealot, two stalker, one zealot, one stalker, zero zealot, zealot, two stalker. If he's just going for some sort of one gate play, do your guess to th do your best to three gate or four gate. Do all this jazz. Suddenly we've taken, we've gone from one strategy and we've renamed it as a group. If he goes for some sort of three stalker push, um, or more general, if he goes for a two gate play in the opening, uh, two gate three stalker push all right cool we suddenly have this weird grouping that ends up popping out from our little early game situation the important thing to note is that you can always let the losses come to you you can just let the losses happen as they would naturally here bling actually goes for a three stalker push so we actually can't suicide our probe all the way in but we are going to be going for this distance push. Ordinarily, at 545, you warp in, like, right here on his ramp. But, okay, well, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Hey, we don't have to abandon ship. Okay. You know what? Let's just say that if we go for a fast three-gate push, if he plays... Um, or, actually, let me do one last category. So, if there's a one-gate play, if there's a two-gate play plus three-stalker, or if he's totally passive... Mega aggro mode. So as we're ending up seeing these sorts of games crop up, we realize, oh, you see these two things that seem to be in somewhat different groups? God, someone is just setting so much on fire tonight. I'm always torn whether I should open my window or not during a daily, because it gets extremely hot in my room when I do it. I have these huge floodlights on, so it gets like 85 degrees when I'm doing every show. That's why I always look a little parched. My god, man, that's the, the, the sirens are so loud. So we might do something specific, like we might have this abandoned ship opening. We might have this, you know, bringing in the, the second pro, build your forward pylon more quickly. Alternatively, what we can do is we can just say if he resists, do a long distance mid map pylon. All right, cool. What does this let us do? Well, it lets us advance forward. I mean, we might have to, we might have to pull back and retreat on this fight, but in a lot of circumstances, we can end up breaking the front. And this is where I wanna come back and remind everyone of all these possible tech openings that we can do. If we do this big, aggressive, crazy push, suddenly we are not nearly as threatened by um, fast Dark Templar. Why? Because we are in his base killing him almost all the time. We're not nearly as threatened by any sort of tech-based um, fast robos because we can put on so much pressure on it. We're not worried about them attacking us. And suddenly we're not as worried about the ultra, ultra fast blink plays because as we're seeing, Bling is having to spend all his freaking time or excuse me, all his freaking money building stalkers. He can't actually afford to do uh, a, a big amount of blink at this point in time as well. 
Either way, he either nailed the blink or he didn't. No matter what, he's building a lot of stalkers. Notice how I said that. It's not the blink that's making us go immortals, it's just that there's a lot of stalkers. Blink would generally make him build more stalkers, or uh, having him build a bunch of stalkers in front of your face and going, look there, stalkers, ho! All these kinds of things um, you can easily use to, wow, chrono boost out two immortals really easily. And now Grubby may very well um, just expand straight up after he gets these pair of immortals. Easy peasy. So I like this uh, this big push timing from Grubby because for one it defended against a lot, for two it helped us cross off a lot of possibilities, and for three it actually had a transition. It wasn't I hold off early pushes and then I try to kill him with this and if it doesn't work I go, ah. We're ending up doing is just crossing off huge swathing groups of things um, and just stepping forward. If you start to get to like Grandmaster level, but honestly not much earlier than that, you can start breaking things into ultra specifics, like say, hey, if he goes two immortal plays, I can respond like this, and if he goes one immortal play, I can respond like that. Almost always, you can just fairly easily just say, if he is going immortals, then blah, that's my possible answer to it. So I'm going to do my usual thing and take questions. I will say, um, for the questions, the concept of grouping things together is the one I really want to take questions on. So, uh, if you say something like, in PvP, what should I do if he DT rushes? That is not a, that is not an appropriate answer. Or, not an appropriate question. Ah. 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 I have something in my eyes. Ah. Okay. Okay. There we go. It's gone. I don't know if any of you contact users ever have these sorts of things. All right. Let me see. Ooh, Marky updated the question grabber for no other reason than he's awesome. Oh, Marky. I'm at five until it pops back up. Uh, and let me note that for any of you um, who are curious about um, how do you group and all that good stuff, you can group it into generalities of how you end up losing, you know, or just uh, in terms of tech patterns, if he goes Twilight Council or if he goes Robo and create big answers for those. Um, that's generally how I end up doing it a lot is by grouping it by tech path, but the most common one is by expanding. Damn it, Marky, the question things are not working. Arg. Arg. Let's see here. Okay, here's a great question from Tearhawk. Says day nine, to figure out the possibilities in a particular matchup to begin grouping, is it better to watch a lot of StarCraft, play a lot of StarCraft, or is there a list to read over before playing? Um, I have, I have different tiers of answers. <laughs> the lowest tier, which is the lowest level of commitment, is just play. Because honestly, you're playing for you. You're not playing to try to like be the greatest ever. You're probably just playing because you have fun and you enjoy the act of improving, and that's great. Uh, and you can honestly just get as all the information you need from your own playing. And I can say this because this is honestly how I do it with having played for years competitively. You just play a lot, lose a lot, and figure out all that's really there. So that's the first one. Play your own games and just start grouping your losses into categories. God, I seem to be losing to Immortals a lot. Or, God, I seem to be losing to Stargates a lot. Um, the second tier is to watch, like, 50 games of a matchup at times 8 speed. Just like the first 10 minutes to see what sort of openings there are. Ooh, we could go for really fast Banshees. Oh, we could go for a fast push. Oh, we could go for this sort of three racks. That will probably take you just, like, two or three hours but then you'll have an, a near comprehensive list if you actually did go watch 50 games. Um, this can actually work nicely if you download a replay pack of a player. Just look for any replay pack. Like if you're a Zerg player, look up Zerg replay pack and then you'll see 50 games of that guy against Terran. Just watch all of them and you'll see a whole different slew of stuff. Um, let me see here. Marky, your question grabber didn't work. Jam it. And uh, the last tier of all is to um, get a notebook and to write 
everything that you see down in that notebook. <laughs> well, perhaps everything is not the uh, the the big the the important thing to do, but to have I use a lot of electronic stuff so I can re-edit it. Uh, but anytime you're watching a game on stream or watching a game on GSL or after you play a game, look back at your grouping list and see if that stuff falls into any grouping at all. I do that a lot. I do actually this a lot. Okay, here's a question from Infinity. He says, should you make a subgroup? based off his aggression for fast expand or should you always plan for either fast expand um, or one base so um, I honestly base most of my groupings around when he's going to attack or when I'm going to attack um, th those are the the big ones like for instance if he goes uh, if he goes for some sort of delayed four gate or for some sort of ultra fast immortal push both of those and well, let's say end up hitting around eight minutes or something like that 730 um i would probably group those together just because i can estimably hold both of them off with some good um force fieldage i think he's an idiot for doing that <laughs> the really fast immortal push but still um that's probably how i end up doing it largely because that's how i'll end up losing if he goes DT rush and then doesn't DT rush me and I just got lucky, I'm fine with that for my learning. I let the losses dictate when uh, when I need to adjust. So feel free to just let losses happen. And of course, um, the one thing that I would add as a caveat is that often it can be really, really difficult if you're if he's expanding and you're too much in defense mode. I talked about that a little bit before where, you know, I'm talking about aggression so much if he does this attack or that attack or that attack or that attack or that attack and you're like, okay, defending against all of these, all right, I'm cool. And then he doesn't attack and he expands and you're like, ah, dish. Um, I, would, I, I would say that no matter what you're doing, make sure that you're trying to get an expansion up as fast as possible. If you see him expand way earlier than you thought, get ready to make a huge attack. Just like Grubby did in game one. Uh, Milk and Cereal says day nine after we group these uh, early to mid game groupings should we then focus on grouping for uh, mid game late game two base three base multi base strats yeah uh, honestly the groupings will go down over time generally uh, because I mean for instance big groupings in Zerg vs Protoss he's either going Roach Hydra Corruptor or Ling Muta or he's going for um Oh, hell, I don't know. Ling, uh, Roach, Infester. Those are probably the big three I can think of. Roach, Hydra, Corruptor, Ling, Muta, or um, Ling, Roach, Infester. And you might say, well, aren't there more groupings than that? Well, I mean, sure, maybe if he goes Roach, Ling, Muta, um, throws the Roach in there, it'll feel basically identical to Ling, Muta. And this is what's nice about having these groupings is that they're kind of, they end up being kind of all-encompassing. Like, um, if some guy goes Ling, Muta, and then gets some roaches, he goes Ling, Muta, and then gets three expansions versus two, or goes Ling, Muta, and then gets a couple of Banelings in there, you pretty much don't change what you're doing. But if he's going Mutalisk at all, that's when the big change happens. So try to do as little... Uh, rearrangement as possible. The big scary thing that I see players do too much in mid and late game is they overreact to differences. Mutalisks are a unit that's entirely unique and you have to do something like get Blink Stalkers and play defensively and be really watchful. But if he's going Ling Muta and then he gets Banelings, don't overthink it. Don't be like, well crap, now that he's going Banelings, I need to make sure that I have this proportion of force fields. I need to abandon my plan of going Phoenixes to defend against his Mutalisks. You don't have to worry about any of that. You just have to have slightly better force fielding. Um, I'm done. For next week's Fun Day Monday, submit to me a mana battle 
Mana Battle, Mana Battle, to Monday at Day9.tv. Tomorrow and Thursday, we're going to be looking at games from the Lone Star Clash. Uh, the games today were actually from the Lone Star Clash. Forgot to mention that. Sorry. Uh, but we're definitely going to be looking at some Pult Stefano stuff and going back to some ultra-high-level analysis stuff. But until then, put stuff into groups. Think in terms of groups and don't overwhelm yourself. Play some. Have fun. I'm done. You're beautiful. And thank you very much for watching today. Mm. I will say, uh, as a total aside... The last month was so much traveling. Holy crap. I went to Boston for the MIT Sloan thing. And I also did a talk at the MIT Gambit uh, Game Lab, which I actually just uh, tweeted a link to. And then I did the... Um I did South by Southwest, I did a panel there, and then I went to New York for a gala for Forbes 30 Under 30, and then I went to Orlando to do the Red Bull LAN for six days, and then I came back and I still did two dailies, and then I went off to do um, MLG uh, from Thursday to Monday, I got back midday on Monday and still did Fun Day Monday, and now I'm doing Newbie Tuesday, Ugh. and I'm still doing other projects as well, Ha, man mode. I don't know if that's good or bad, but I did a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I want someone to be like, go, Sean. I'm like, yeah, I travel and I hate planes. Um, yes. So there will be more shows coming up throughout the week. And go subscribe to Geek and Sundry. That's it. Thank you a lot for being so supportive. I've had so many nice fans say so many nice things, and you're all great. Oh my god, you're so great. Thank you. Goodbye!